Welcome to the referendum debate. With exactly six months to go today, the argument is really heating up. We've come to Fife and Kirkcaldy's Adam Smith Theatre to see if our panel and audience can add some light to the heat. Good evening. On our panel tonight, one politician and one campaigner from each side of the debate. The Scottish Government's Finance Secretary and former leader of the SNP, John Swinney. Also with us, Labour's welfare spokeswoman, Jackie Bailey. The founder of the Scottish Fashion Awards and Better Together campaigner, Tessa Hartman. And a former Conservative candidate who is now campaigning for independence, the historian, Michael Fry. And to ensure a good debate, our audience tonight are evenly divided between supporters and opponents of independence, with a healthy dose of undecideds too. Welcome to Kirkcaldy. Not many towns are known for their smell. But not so long ago, Kirkcaldy had a distinctive odour from the linoleum made here and laid all over the world. It was just one example of this port's trading heritage. Coal, salt and whaling all brought in money over the years. And this bustling commercial hub also gave birth to a set of ideas which has defined our age. It was here, in his mother's house, that Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, the Bible of capitalism. Of course, the free market remains controversial, not least in the kingdom of Fife, still feeling the effects of a decline in heavy industry. And the economic theories developed here in the Lang Toon are now centre stage in a new debate about the future of Scotland. So let's get on with that debate now. And as ever, our audience here in Kirkcaldy have submitted their questions and our panel have not seen them. Our first question this evening is from Cameron Berwick. Cameron Berwick. Is today's announcement from Scottish Labour too little, too late? John Swinney. Um, well, the first thing I'd say is that uh, the acknowledgement by the Labour Party that there is a need for the powers of the Scottish Parliament to be increased is a welcome admission that the status quo is no longer sustainable, and that has, of course, been the position of the Scottish National Party. I think in addressing Cameron's question, um, I think it is too little, too late, and it's a whimper compared to what the Labour Party's interim report on this subject said some months ago. Uh, months ago, the Labour Party interim report was suggesting that they would devolve all of income tax to Scotland and only a fraction of it has been devolved. Air passenger duty was to be devolved and it's now not going to be devolved. Various other taxes were going to be devolved and they're not going to be devolved. So I think it is a very poor uh, proposition from the Labour Party. And if people want to acquire more powers with certainty, with confidence that they can be used to improve the prosperity of our country and to tackle inequality, then they've got to vote yes in the referendum in September. Saki Bailey, your party has today set out its proposal for what happens if Scotland votes no, these extra powers. John Swinney suggests they've been watered down. Isn't it, as the questioner says, too little too late? That's not the case at all. What we've brought forward is a very ambitious package um, that responds to the consultation that we've been undertaking that is saying we need more devolution of income tax powers, we need more devolution of welfare over housing benefit and attendance allowance, we need to entrench the Scottish Parliament in legislation and actually we need to deliver accountability not just for the Scottish Parliament and the money we raise and our proposals would see 75% of income tax in our hands, 40% of the overall taxation in the Scottish Parliament in our hands but equally maintaining a balance with the Barnett formula because at the end of the day we want to make sure that our finances are absolutely certain and secure so that we can deliver the kind of public services that we've all enjoyed. But more than that, 
is not just enough to devolve power from one parliament and one set of politicians to another parliament and another set of politicians. Our ambition is actually to devolve power to local government and to communities themselves. I think that's what's radical about our package. And it is a package that, if you like, gives us devolution max. Um, and what I would argue is that if you are voting for independence, if you are voting yes, you are voting to entrench austerity in the Scottish economy. Very keen, very keen to hear the views from people on the floor. Please put your hand up if you, if you want to contribute. I wonder if I can come back to you, Cameron, first of all, though. Do you think it's too little too late? I think it is. I agree with John Swinney. I think, why didn't Labour implement this when they were in power? Oh, why didn't you? Because at every stage of the devolution journey, it's been Labour that's been pushing the progressive case. We argued for the establishment of the Scottish Parliament. The SNP sat apart from the Constitutional Convention. Um, Calman Commission has seen the biggest transfer of financial powers to the Scottish Parliament in the Scotland Act of 2012. The SNP set apart from that process, and now we want to continue that devolution journey. I think it's an evolving journey. It's not just about you know, where power lies. It's how we use it that's so critically important. The problem, the, problem with that, the, 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 the problem with that analysis is that if we wait for the Labour Party, we'll be waiting forever yeah. to get the power <laughs> that Jackie's talking about. Now, just, just, just go back to the, you know, a few years ago, the Calman Commission was set up by the Labour Party, the Liberals and the Conservatives, to come up with the absolutely essential extra powers we had to get. And the Calman Commission made some recommendations. We didn't even get all the powers that the Calman Commission set out. And now the Labour Party are back with another version which is watered down on what was put forward in the okay, interim report. And the reason for that is the Labour Party is riven with internal dissent about further powers for the Scottish Parliament. And if Labour can't agree with themselves, how will they ever agree with the other parties? Scotland, if it wants to get more powers, has got to get the power in our hands through the referendum in September by voting yes. Okay. I'll come back to you in a minute. We'll come down here for a couple of points from the floor and then we'll bring in our other guests. Yes, sir. Jackie, you said yourself that um, if Scotland were to vote yes, we'd be, you know, entrenching ourselves by austerity. I don't understand where you're coming with that. I mean, it seems to me that in Scotland we're getting a choice in September between definite austerity from the Tory party, from the Labour party who have promised that austerity will continue, or just maybe austerity, but in a country where we, the Scots, get to decide to get ready any party that would ever you know, send that kind of abuse to our other populace. OK, thank you. <laughs> yes, and, and the, man, the man there, yeah. Mr Swinney, you said that the Labour Party will take forever to make a decision. This is a no-go-back scenario. We should take our time. We should get it right. That's where my point is. Let's not rush at things. Let's do it the right way. Mm. OK, thank you. Michael Fry, just coming back to the question, is today's announcement from Scottish Labour too little too late? What's your view? Well, I think uh, in the light of it, it's very easy to see why the No campaign has been so negative so far. Um, because as soon as they uh, try to become positive, they, they go all to pieces. I mean, we have got, I think, a very feeble package from the, uh, from the Labour Party. We've got, uh, I mean, a Tory, Tory Struan Stevenson last weekend called for full fiscal freedom. For the, uh, for the Scottish Parliament, that is your practical independence apart from foreign policy, and the uh, Lib Dems are coming up with a federal system. I mean, but I'm Mr Stevenson's position is not the official position of the Conservatives. No, no, but I think it's very interesting that uh, Conservatives are drifting that way. I mean, certainly there's no, uh, there's no future for them in their uh, complete standstill that they've had so far. But I think if the, if, the, uh, you know, if the opposition parties in the Scottish Parliament are going to get anywhere, uh, in their campaign, I think they, uh, they need to agree on some common programme. And it's obvious that so far they're completely incapable of doing that. Well, I, I'd like to put that to Tessa Hartman. I mean, you've been involved, I think it's fair to say, with the Better Together campaign. Um, should there be a, a common position? And, and is this announcement too little too late, as the questioner asks? Well, I don't think it is, because I think, referring to the gentleman down there, I think um, being a young business person, I think we all have to consider um, that you can't change this decision and that SNP would really have us believe that, um, you know, once you vote independence, you know, nothing else is going to happen here. So I think more devolved powers in Scotland is a way forward. You know, the Scottish Parliament has worked and it's worked well. 
And I'm a firm believer that being part of a stronger economy um, to save us against all these you know, financial recessions and you know, international issues that we could possibly face, <coughs> um, having more devolved powers in Scotland will be better for the Scottish people. Uh, because the reality is the SNP, in my view, um, can't really tell us what the specific plans are in case things don't work out. I'd like to, like to come to the woman at the very back of the hall. Um, I think in terms of devolved powers, um, one of my concerns would be that the recent reacquisition of the energy budget, which was a devolved power to Scotland, um, was taken back by the House of Lords without any voting. So how can we um, protect our services if they are devolved? OK, and the man, the man here, yeah. I think uh, John Swinney's been very disingenuous about Labour's plans and what Labour done previously. I mean, in 1997, Labour came in and moved very quickly to the establishment of the Scottish Parliament. They can do so again with devolution. And to take Tessa's point, all that can happen in a situation where Scotland has stability, none of the uncertainty that is undoubtedly going to come should they vote for independence. John Swinney? Well, if you actually look at the substance of what Labour have put forward today, um, it is a fraction of what was being proposed just a little while ago by the Labour Party. 80% of revenues in Scotland will still be decided by Westminster. That's not much more devolution. By the end of the Scotland Act proposals that I'm currently implementing, we'll have about control over 16% of the revenues. The Labour Party is going to really take this commanding leap and we're going to go from 16 to 20 and we're going to leave 80% in the hands of Tory governments in London who can do exactly what they want. And as the lady at the back of the, the audience said there, they can decide if they want to take powers back uh, because it's, uh, if, if it happens to suit the UK government. And Jackie made the point earlier on that this would entrench the powers of uh, the Scottish Parliament. I have, I, it's beyond me to understand how that can be capable of being done in a country that does not have a written constitution. If we want to have entrenched powers for our Scottish Parliament, we need to have a written constitution as part of an independent country, assuring rights and guaranteeing the security and the safety and the constitutional rights of the people that live in this country. Jackie Bailey, Jackie Bailey, last April, in, in April 2013, an interim report by your party said there was a strong case for devolving income tax in full, as well as backing devolution of vehicle excise and air passenger duties. Well, you have watered down your plans, haven't you? No, no, we haven't. Because well, you that, evidently, that, evidently you no, have. No, no, we, we, we haven't, because that interim report contained absolutely nothing about welfare. Um, we're now devolving housing benefit. What we brought so it's forward, one thing or the other. What we brought forward is a balanced package. And actually, the key question for me is, you know, because when I talked about entrenching um, austerity, you need to examine the package that the SNP are proposing. Just last week, we had, if you like, um, the JES report, which is Scotland's balance sheet. Scotland's balance sheet is in deficit by £12 well, billion. Well, I'd, pounds. I'd quite like it's, to stick to your plans for now, because we'll come on to that. Well, no, I think, I think it's important that you understand the difference between um, our proposals, which are based on pooling and sharing resources across the United Kingdom, and the SNP's risk and gamble of having a deficit that they can't explain to us how they would close. Now, okay. I value public services. How are we going to pay for those public services if there's £12 billion less in the budget? How are we going to pay, how are we going to pay for those public services if the Get SNP... Of the if the SNP... Well, I'll deal with that in a minute. But if the SNP want to cut corporation tax by 3% more than jo George Osborne, if the SNP will not use the 50 pence higher rate of tax Tax proposed by Labour so that those you know, with the broadest right. shoulders right. actually bear some of the burden. Okay, now, thank you. It, but no, thank you. No, we'll leave it there for now. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask some of our audience to contribute as well. And we'll come, yes, just down here, yes, in, uh, just, just to the back there. How can you say that there would be a, a fair and a more equitable distribution when there are enormous capital projects in London, HS2, the Cross Rail Link, all of these things which are costing absolutely millions of pounds, and yet you're saying that, there, that being in a stronger economy would be better. I, I, firstly, I don't agree that it would be stronger, but secondly, the vast amount of money that's being spent to bring uh, trains from London to the north 
Manchester, four and a half hour drive from here to get to Manchester. Okay. How is that the north? Thank That's you. not a fair distribution of the, the funding. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and the man in the check shirt. Yes, sir, in the check shirt. Then. Yeah, I'd just like to say that the reason that the Labour Party have changed is because we're a democratic party and we listen to our members and we agree things. We're not a dictation. Di Theatership like the SNP, where one man there, decides what, everything. In what sense? I mean, in fairness to the SNP, do, do they not have democratic party structures? You bet, well, you bet, you bet they do. <laughs> it doesn't seem that way when you see them on the television. There's only one man who makes all the decisions. Well, this man was kicked out of office. Well, there you are. He, he just Jim, does what he's Jim, told, Jim. doesn't he? Jim, Jim, James is just commenting on my indignity and all of this, but you believe you me, the SNP is a, a thoroughly democratic party, power resting in our members, but we come to the decisions that are right for the people of Scotland because we're ambitious for the people of Scotland and we're in authority for that. Well, you can certainly, get, you can certainly get a cheer for that, but that doesn't make you democratic. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Um, we'll take a couple more, a couple more. The man in the blue in the middle, the blue shirt, just uh, further into the middle. Yes, Thanks. yes. When you're, when you're talking about uh, how we would fund these things, uh, I mean, the, the deficit already includes uh, paying a share of UK debt, paying for Trident, paying for the House of Lords, lots of things that would go with independence. Uh, I, I don't see how this deficit would be anywhere near the deficit that we're already facing as part of the UK. OK, thank you very much. And... Um, just behind you, yes, with the glasses, gentlemen with the glasses. Yeah, uh, I would just like to sort of address Jackie Bailey, um, because um, to paraphrase a woman, uh, the lady is for turning. Um, you realise that the no campaign is just not working and you've decided now that you have to produce something different. I mean, this is from the party that um, in 97 said things can only get better. <laughs> just before they left, um, it would be an end to boomer bust forever and then they blamed everything but themselves for the global mess that they left the country in. So I think it's a question of not only as John Swinney said ambition but also about faith and trust and those things you can't politicise over you either believe in them or you don't and okay. I certainly believe in the yes campaign. Thank you. Well at this stage, I think we'll move on because we may well come to some of these uh, points in due course, maybe very soon, because the next question comes from Suzanne Adams. Suzanne. Um, with numerous, uh, numerous companies saying that they would leave Scotland if it becomes independent, what job opportunities would be available for my age group? Tessa Hartman. Well, I think that's a very big problem. I think, you know... Um, you have to consider when companies the size of Standard Life um, come out, you know, they, they look after a budget that's in the billions of pounds. They employ thousands of people. The financial services sector in Scotland alone employs some 200,000 people. And they have a duty of care to their customers. So when they actually come out and they tell us that they're worried about financial uncertainty because of the currency issue, they don't know um, how they'll pay their wages and what currency, they don't know how they're going to set their interest rates, all of this, and they have to make provisions to look after the customer, primarily because their biggest customer is actually in England. Um, so I think you have to consider um, that going forward, if all these companies um, are facing this uncertainty, they have to make choices. And these choices are certainly going to affect the future young people um, because, you know, they employ such a massive amount of people in Scotland. Suzanne, can I ask you, if, uh, are you worried about your job prospects in an independent Scotland, as, as I suppose your question suggests? I think not knowing what I want to do when I'm older does cause worries for me personally anyway. Uh, but in terms of does it make a difference whether Scotland would be independent or remain part of the U UK? Are you, do you have, are you worried about one scenario more than the other? Um, I'm more worried about Scotland becoming independent than if we stayed together. Okay. I think it'd be better if we were together. Michael Fry, there's a, can you reassure this, this young lady? Well, I would say there's no point in uh, Scottish independence unless the uh, economic performance of the country can be improved. I would say for the last uh, 50 years, the economy of Scotland has been underperforming. Um, and the energies of the people have uh, been dissipated. There's loads of emigration. There's loads of unemployment. Um, and why is this? Is it because the UK government treats Scotland as a backward region uh, fit only for, uh, for subsidies uh, and for uh, uh, useless interventions by the state. 
So I would say that the, uh, what we have to get in, in, in Scotland is a faster growth rate uh, to provide the, the jobs for, for, uh, for young people and for the unemployed. And it seems to me uh, it's perfectly obvious that all the policies that have been tried by UK governments uh, in, the, in the past 50 years have failed to produce a faster but, but growth rate. Is that, is, that, is that your argument that simply it couldn't be any worse or do you have a positive vision for, for, for why it, it would be good for Suzanne and why she, her job prospects well, would be improved? Well, if we seize the levers of, uh, of macroeconomic power, the, the big things about the economy, not, not the silly fiddling things we have at the moment, uh, if we raise our own taxes um, and uh, decide on our own expenditure over not just uh, 16 or 20 percent but over 100 percent, then we really have scope to improve things. But while we're fiddling around at the margins, there is going to be no improvement in Scotland's economic performance. Jackie Bailey. I do think that we need to think very carefully. It's not politicians telling you this. It's not scaremongering. It's company after company explaining what they consider the risks to be. Um, Standard Life and the Alliance saying that they are already looking to set up companies in the rest of the UK because they're concerned about currency, they're concerned about regulation, they're concerned that the environment that they would need to operate in, frankly, is not conducive to their business. Nine out of ten of their customers actually come from the rest of the UK. Um, so they are making plans to consider moving out of Scotland to do that. Um, and you only need to look up the road. Babcock saying that 800 jobs would be wiped out from Recife. A Greco in my constituency saying that they would need to consider moving elsewhere. Now, you know, I don't say that to, to frighten people. I do say that because... <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. It's these companies that are saying that. You know, to dismiss the them, to dismiss them, to would be to dismiss these major issues. So it's the UK government that's creating the uncertainty, not well, the Scottish no, government. Yeah, why, why not answer but this are, question? Isn't the, why not answer this question? Hold on a second. These are genuinely major companies that are warning about the consequences of this. We ignore them at our peril. Can I, I say? I understand that I mean, point. Michael, what's, your, Michael, what's your answer to that question? <laughs> Michael's interest. Michael's interest quite is is in a low tax small state economy, make no mistake they about that. They grow faster, that's make why. Make no mistake they grow about faster. that. But what is the consequence for people who can't participate? You know, you they do get not. Jobs. You do not. They get richer. No, they don't. All right. It's, like, it's thank a you. very thank you both. society that you're describing. Thank you. Now, we'll come, we'll do without somebody. John Swinney, I mean, doesn't Jackie Bailey have a point here? I mean, we have seen a parade of big companies saying they are concerned, at the very least, about independence. BP, the Alliance Trust, RBS, Lloyds, Shell, Agreco was mentioned there as well. Don't these companies have genuine concerns that, that you have not addressed? I think what you've got to do is to look at what these companies are actually undertaking as part of the, the exercise which has given rise to these, uh, to these points that have been made. Each company is setting out what are the political issues that they have to face going forward. Um, as well as talking about Scottish independence, all these companies are also talking about the threats to their business arising out of the referendum on EU membership that the Conservative government wants to yes, have but, but in 2017. Sure, but that and doesn't so, mean that so the independence so threat is not so, a threat, so is it? So what I'm simply saying is that these companies have a duty in terms of their responsibility as directors, as board members, to set out the political issues that they face. Now, to look at the substance of this issue, in 2011, the Chancellor of the Exchequer came to Scotland and he basically said uh, the, ref the, the holding of the referendum debate of itself is undermining foreign direct investment in Scotland. And we have seen since then two years of what has been described as sparkling economic growth in foreign direct investment in Scotland. So all of this talk about the uncertainties and difficulties of independence to me is baseless. What independence is about is about creating the economic opportunities to do all that we can with the powers, the responsibilities and the resources to create the economic opportunities that enable young women like Suzanne to have a vibrant and dynamic career within an independent Scotland in a way that far too many people from my generation have been unable to find those careers because of the economic policies of the United Kingdom government. <laughs> See, plenty of hands up, so we'll come to the man in the blue shirt, first of all, yes. 
The purpose of a business is to fill a void, find a target market and fill that void. If these companies, who have got 9 out of 10 customers south of the border, if they leave, the Scottish people are intelligent enough to fill that void. <laughs> provide <laughs> And the woman in yellow there, yes, with the black hair. Um, I just actually want to come back to a point that Jackie Bailey just briefly made towards the end uh, when she was speaking to Michael Fry about um, him describing an unequal society. Is that why we're sitting in the fourth most unequal society in the whole world and the most unequal society in Western Europe? In, okay. Sorry, in the Western world. OK, thank you. And the, the, the man in front of you in the white shirt. It's OK talking about all these big companies, but Scotland has very few big companies that actually belong to Scotland. All the other big companies that have got private investors, the money doesn't stay in Scotland, it gets taken out of Scotland. So how does the SNP <laughs> propose to manage the finances? OK, thank you. And at the back, in blue at the back, yeah. Um, Jackie Bailey spoke about, um, and Tessa Hartman as well, actually, about nine out of ten of these businesses, the customer base being in England. Why does that matter? Look at the big multinational companies that have customers all over the world. Why do they need to be based where the customers are? OK, thank you. We'll come to the man in the front in the waistcoat. Mr Fry mentioned not playing with tiddly bits of the economy but using big levers. I'd like to ask Mr Swinney who will be setting monetary policy in an independent Scotland? Will it be the Bank of England? Will it be the ECB? Or will it be some Bank of Scotland? And also, how will you convince any of the Scottish banks to remain in Scotland? Oh, Let me make a, a point, first of all, about the, this point about the economic powers we currently have. One of the views that I hold very firmly, and it's based up by, by, backed up by data, is that the economy of Scotland has improved and strengthened since we acquired the limited powers of devolution since 1999. And any analysis of economic data will demonstrate that to be the case. And what that shows, and it's not just about the SNP administration, it's also about the Labour administration, of which Jackie was a part, where Scotland is able to exercise different and distinctive economic policies, we are able to deliver a better outcome. And you look at it today, we've got higher employment in Scotland and lower unemployment in the rest of the UK in the current difficult economic circumstances because of the steps that we are taking. Now, on your question, sir, about um, monetary policy, we've been absolutely crystal clear that monetary policy for an independent Scotland would be set as part of a sterling zone by the Bank of England, as part of the arrangements, as part of... As, as part of arrangements that were set out by the Fiscal Commission, a group of eminent international economists who set out exactly how an independent Scotland could cooperate with the rest of the United Kingdom on currency policy. And the decisions that would be arrived at in, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the points considered by the Bank of England in setting interest rates for the whole of uh, for the, the sterling zone would be to address the economic conditions and circumstances right across the United Kingdom. I want Kingdom. to come to the man right at the front in the red. Yes, Mr. Mr. Swinney should really come down to planet Earth with his ludicrous fantasy nonsense about having a, a sterling zone because the people you're, you're going to be in negotiation with two sides, you on one side, the rest of the parties in the UK on the other side, and they are saying no. Tessa Harpin, you, you were... You... Buttons for a currency. Say, say that again, sir. We might as well use buttons for a currency. <laughs> All right, Tessa Hartman. You know, I, I think the SNP are literally determined to stick to independence at any price. And the currency, for me, is probably one of the most important and the biggest issues. And the reality is you cannot adopt an uh, informal currency arrangement with a country. Um, Mark Carney, the, the head of the Bank of England, has come out and warned us about it. We literally were faced with this depressing compromise of negotiations. So he's asking all of you to say, go to the polling stations, but when you get there, we're not really sure about what currency. We're not really going to sure how that's going to affect the deficit. And we don't really know how we're going to pay for it, but vote anyway. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> Um, the man in the blue shirt, in, in the blue shirt, in the middle, right in the middle, yes. Uh, could all this uncertainty not be sorted out? Be before we were asked to go to the polls, it would have been quite easy to have everything put on the table for us, the electorate, to make an informed decision in advance. This is, this is open to, to us. The, the, the SNP and the Scottish Government offered it in advance. It was turned down. OK, there is... 
It is so. I think it's fair to say there's some concern in the room about the currency. I mean, the, the gentleman there said we, we might as well use buttons for the currency. Well, let's, let's, let's go back to look at the substance of this. Mark Carney came to Edinburgh a few weeks ago and set out the basis upon which uh, a currency union could be established between an independent Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And all of the issues that Mr Carney raised um, in what I thought was a very thoughtful and dispassionate uh, analysis of this issue were considered by the Fiscal Commission. They were all about the way in which we'd undertake uh, prudential regulation across the whole of the Stirling Zone, about how we would have to sign up as an independent country to a fiscal framework around the amount of debt that we'd have to incur and the amount of borrowing that we could undertake. All of these issues were foreseen, for, for, foreseen by the Fiscal Commission in the work that was undertaken. And what this whole debate misses is the fact, and, and the comments of the other political parties that have made comments on all this, is the interest of the rest of the United Kingdom. Is a UK Chancellor going to turn round to businesses in the rest of the UK and say, I am now going to make your business proposition less competitive by increasing your costs of dealing with Scotland, which is the second biggest market that you will deal with as part of your export well, activities? Jackie Bailey, that is a most that unlikely point. proposition. Let, let me just deal with that latter point because actually um, the rest of the UK export twice as much to the USA than they do to Scotland, four times as much to Europe as they do to Scotland. <clears throat> actually the reality is the transaction costs would be a problem for Scotland exporting to England because again we export twice as much to England than we do to the whole of the rest of the world. But can I come back to the, the currency question because this, this genuinely is, is central. You would be handing control over your currency, over your interest rates, over your fiscal policy, to the Bank of England, to the UK Treasury, at the same time as you're saying, by the way, we don't want any accountability, so we're withdrawing all the Scottish MPs. That is crazy economics. You know, we would have less control all right. we've, under we've, that system than we do now. We have, we have rather drifted from Suzanne's question, which I suppose is my fault, to be fair. But um, the question actually related to job opportunities that would be available for her age group in... in uh, an independent Scotland. I mean, Michael Fry, it, it, it is related, I suppose, to all these issues, because if there is uncertainty about how an, uh, an independent Scotland would proceed economically, then there's uncertainty for Suzanne, isn't there? Well, the best way to create jobs is through a market economy. Uh, in all the, uh, the, the, the most rapidly developing countries of the world, the market economy is the one that prevails. Um, mm. And uh, in Scotland, we have an economy where the, the hand of the state lies too heavy on us. And the only way we can get out from under that heavy hand um, is by, by becoming an independent country and having our own market policies. That is the way in which employment will be created. That is the way uh, through which Scotland will become a richer country. All right, well, on that uh, Adam Smith-style point, I suppose it's a good moment to leave that particular question. You can, of course, join tonight's debate on Twitter using the hashtag BBCNDREF or by texting us on 80295. Please do include your name there if you text us, 80295, the number. And to see a selection of your comments, go to the BBC Scotland news website. And while we're at it, if you want to come and take part in a future programme, we'll be in Kirkwall in Orkney on the 15th of April and then after the break on the 8th of July we'll be in Portree on the Isle of Skye. So to apply to join an island audience, just go online and search for BBC Referendum Debate. Right now though, let's take our next question which comes from Sandy Steele. Sandy Steele. Does the panel believe that the BBC have been impartial on their coverage of the Scottish referendum? Interesting to note the applause. Michael Fry. <laughs> well, of course, the, uh, the BBC has a duty of impartiality, and I'm sure on uh, most occasions it carries that out. Uh, this does not mean, however, that the BBC is able to control in detail what particular interviewers ask particular questions, uh, ask particular uh, uh, politicians, what questions they put. Um, and I would say there was, you know, I, I'm sure I don't need to name names or to go into details. I think there was a, uh, a, a, a recent example where the BBC fell short of its uh, duty of impartiality. 
Now, I think, I think, the, interesting, interesting, I think the interesting, I thought, if I may just finish, yeah. the interesting thing is how the BBC responds in these circumstances with, I would say, a blatant piece of, uh, uh, of partiality. And that is to say, oh, nothing really has happened. Um, and this is, I think, to be ascribed to the bureaucratic nature of the BBC and its inability to, 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 to say it has been wrong. The BBC has noble ideals, but I think it needs to pull its socks up in fulfilling those noble ideals. Well, I think I in fairness, <laughs> you're too kind. Um, I, I think in fairness, we should perhaps explain to the people who maybe don't know what you're referring to. I mean, I think the question I, I would guess is wider than this, but there was a, 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 not actually a formal complaint from the SNP, but we'll come on to that. There, there were mutterings anyway at the weekend about uh, Andrew Marr interviewing Alex Salmond, in which Mr. Marr said, I think it will be quite hard to get back in, I have to say, back into the EU that was. Uh, the BBC's position is that uh, Mr. Marr made, himself made it clear on that he had not been intending to express a personal opinion. He was putting forward an argument from President José Manuel de Rao Barroso. Um, John Swinney, do you think the BBC, as the question asks, has been impartial? Um, I think the BBC has an absolutely cast iron duty to be utterly impartial during the referendum debate, and it must be seen to be utterly impartial during the whole of the referendum debate. Well, the, the, there are obviously um, great points of debate, but I don't think it's really the, 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 kind of the perspective of an elected politician to be the judge about whether the BBC has been impartial or not. Let's leave it to members of the public to judge on that question. But I think that what's important... That sounds like a no to well, me, what's to important, honest, well, what's it, well, well, what, what I'm simply saying is the BBC has got a duty to be impartial in every circumstance in the referendum debate, given the seriousness of the No, no, I know that. Issue. And also, I understand and also, that. The question is, and it's also, not my question, but, uh, it's but, Sandy Steele's yeah, question, but, addressed to everyone on the panel, you're in, yourself included, does the panel believe the BBC has been impartial? I, well, why shouldn't you be asked that? Uh, well, I, I, I don't think it's for me to judge that point, James. What I think it is essential... Well, it's rather is no that, much point coming well, here, then, is there? Well, well no, because I'm, I'm, very happy to, I'm very happy to answer lots of questions about all sorts of subjects. Subjects, whether not, I should not be, the ones you choose whether, not to whether, answer. Whether I should be the judge about the BBC's performance is a different matter. But, but, isn't, it, isn't, it, but isn't it important, is it not entirely relevant to this debate that the, 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 the big, the, the, I suppose the national broadcaster, if you want to call it that, um, conducts itself in a proper manner and isn't that something that politicians have a stake yes, in? Yes, and, and that's precisely what I have been saying. The national broadcaster must conduct itself at all times in a proper fashion and make sure that those who are commenting on the debate in Scotland and who are structuring that debate do so from a well-informed, dispassionate perspective. And that's my view okay, on the issue. Right. We'll, we'll come down and see if we can get some opinions uh, down here. First of all, in the middle, in green... I would just say it doesn't seem to be that the BBC is being impartial. They're actually being very negative and I've taken to stop watching the BBC News and get my news from Russian TV or Al Jazeera because it tends to be more impartial when you're discussing <laughs> Scottish independence. In, when, you, when you say stop watching, what, 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 in what sense do you, do you suggest it's impartial? I think it was a, one of the universities did a study, didn't they? So something like 56 negative stories as opposed to one positive one, I think. I read it on... I tend to go more uh, internet as well for my okay. uh, information. Wings over Scotland tends to be a very impartial blog. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's raised eyebrows at that as well. But um, Tessa Hartman. Um, I think the BBC are doing a good job. It's their job to put... <laughs> You know, it's their job to put all the questions, all the uncomfortable questions that politicians don't want to answer. And the reason we're all talking about this is because the SNP were very angry after the interview that Andrew Marr did on Sunday, literally because he couldn't answer the questions that was being proposed to him. And the, the simple question was, the simple question was, why wouldn't he have a plan B for currency and what was wrong with, say, a Scottish currency? And everybody got very upset, and like you do, and it happens all the time across both political parties, but that's their job, and that's why we all need to, to learn and see the answers and see what they have to say. OK, we'll take a couple more from the floor, and then I'll come up to Jackie Bailey here. Yes, the woman down the front. And is the BBC really capable of being impartial and when it comes to a question that's going to have a huge impact um, on the organisation's future? Um, I think perhaps the BBC should ask some questions about whether it is capable or not and be a little bit more honest with the public when it comes to um, the sides that they take and then perhaps people might be a bit more open to, to what they've got to say on the matter. OK, thank you very much.
and we come to the women in the stripes. The women in the stripes, just slightly further back. Yes. Hi. Um, I don't think it's a question of whether the BBC or any other news media has been negative or positive or impartial or impartial. I think it's the response, the genuine response of the Scottish people to the white paper and to the sort of unstable, um, non sort of negotiable terms that the SNP are proposing if we go independent. So it's not a question of impartiality, it's a question of genuine concern that the media are flagging up. Thank you. And we'll come to uh, at the back, both uh, people at the back. First of all, yourself. Yes, sir. Um, if the BBC are going to allow Alex Salmon significant airtime, shouldn't they be allowed to present the alternative viewpoint as well? OK, thank you very much. And we'll come just along to the, the gentleman slightly further along. Yes, sir. John Sweeney, I, I'd like to vote to, for the Scottish National Party, but I just want a simple yes or a no. We don't want to hear any more. Just a, we want an honest answer, yes or no, to some of the questions, please. Such as, such as this question. Such as this question. Yes. <laughs> give, a, give him a yes or a no. Well, Is the BBC I'm, biased? I'm, I'm, give I'm, him a yes or a no. I'm Why just not? simply saying that I'm simply saying the BBC has got to uh, fulfil its utter duty to impartiality during the referendum campaign, it and is that it is what it's got to do for the duration but of the do referendum campaign. you believe it's campaign. doing it? That is the key point that it, the but BBC has answering. got to address. We, we've asked about 19 times. So we're not getting an answer. Jackie Bailey, what's I'm, your answer? You know, I, it, is the there BBC is no impartial? That, I, I believe the BBC is impartial. I also believe, let me finish, let me finish. I believe this, this contest is going to be, you know, it's, it's hotly contested. There will be a passionate debate. I've been on many panels before and sometimes I felt, oh no, that, that, that wasn't quite right. You know, politicians are fair game. Alex Salmond was asked a very basic question and it comes to the gentleman's point at the back of the room. People want certainty. They want to know the answers. You know, the Scottish Government proposing independence have a responsibility to actually tell people what the answers are. The problem is, as with this question, John Swinney refuses to answer it. You know, it's dead simple. Either the BBC is impartial or it's not. You know, he can't answer that, but he can't answer more fundamental basic questions on currency, on the economy, on welfare, you know. And, you know People are crying out for certainty at home. They, they, don't, they, they don't want the heat of the debate anymore. They actually want some light right. shone on what the proposals okay, are. OK, well, we'll try to do that as we go along. But I'd like to just come back to Sandy Steele, who originally asked that question. I mean, first of all, do you think the BBC is impartial? Um, no, I don't. I think they're incredibly biased. I think most of the reporting around this across the media has been biased and very negative. I will be voting yes but I'm very disappointed in Mr Swinney's response to my question. OK, can I, can I, can I just, I suppose, as they're not here, just, I'm not here to give the BBC's point of view, but, you know, I would defend anybody who's not here in, 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 a, in a devil's advocate way. So I suppose the BBC's position would be that the proposition here, the fundamental proposition is independence and it is necessarily going to be scrutinised. Uh, is, that, is that not the case? And is that not why you, we are seeing more, more of what you say would be negative coverage? I have um, no objection at all to scrutiny. I agree with everyone here tonight who said it's incredibly important that we get this right. But what I am definitely seeing <coughs> on the television and when I open my newspaper is far more time being given to the no and the negative side of this debate than to the yes. Thank you very much. Well, I would just like to say, if anybody feels that's happening tonight, you have an opportunity to put it right by sticking your hand up and joining in the debate. So let's move on to the next question, which comes from Mary Turnbull. The next question from Mary Turnbull. With recent reported falls in North Sea oil revenues and associated tax receipts, would an independent Scotland be overly exposed to volatility in oil revenues? Jackie Bailey. The, the, there is absolutely no doubt that oil has been a tremendous asset for Scotland and for the United Kingdom. It's created jobs, it's helped to create wealth, but you're absolutely right, it is volatile. Um, the, the trend is declining. Um, you only need to look at just last week, where £4.4 billion um, was wiped off the amount of, of oil produced. Um, that is such a significant sum. That is the entirety of the school's budget in Scotland. 
to run every single school. John Swinney, if he was Chancellor, would be standing up in Parliament just now declaring an emergency budget. You know, it knocks such a hole in, in our public finances. Um, so oil is important, but you know, it isn't guaranteed. You cannot deal with any certainty with it. The other illustration I would give you is that when, when oil was at its highest level, compared to when it was at its lowest level, the difference was the funding for the entirety of the Scottish NHS budget. So these are serious matters that we need to consider. Now, I know the SNP proposes not one, but two oil funds to create, I think the word is stability. Um, but, you know, we would need to find the money to put into those oil funds. We don't operate on the basis of a surplus. For the last 20 out of 21 years, we've operated at a deficit. Not my words, but John Swinney's own words that I'm quoting. Um, we would have needed oil to support that. But to, to actually fund an oil fund, we would need to borrow. And it's a bit like going to Wonga for an ISA. The interest rates, the interest rates of borrowing would be more significant than the interest rates earned by the oil fund. Michael Fry, and in order to fund you. it, sorry, in order well, to fund very, it, very briefly, please. In order to fund it, you would either need to cut services or raise taxes, and I think we need answers about which it would be. Michael Fry. Well, Scotland, uh, if it becomes independent, will not be the only country in the world which, from which the, the main source of wealth is a particular resource, a natural resource. There are many other countries around the world, I mean, the other oil producers, and then countries like South Africa and Brazil, which are dependent on particular commodities. Now, to say that uh, Scotland is uniquely incapable of dealing with such a situation is complete nonsense. How would, how would an independent Scotland cope with, with what the, the government accounts show we saw in the last financial year, a 41.5% drop in, in oil revenue? Well, Say that happened in the first well, again, year of independence. All, all governments all over the world, from time to time, suffer falls in particular types of revenue. Shocks that the UK, big. The UK government suffers falls in revenue. The French government, the German government, the Chinese government, but, they all suffer falls in revenue. Uh, in what, there are good years and bad years. It doesn't mean because you have one bad year then your whole economy is going to pieces. As the First Minister pointed out, over the last five years, we've actually, taking all those five years together, done rather well. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it can come as no surprise that after four uh, good years, you get one lean year. And any sensible state, any, any sensible government will have mechanisms and the mechanisms, mechanisms are available to deal okay, with this we'll, kind of situation. We'll come, I'd like to come to Tessa Hartman, please. What, what's, what's your view? I mean, uh, Michael Fry says Scotland would cope as any other country copes. Well, I mean, I think the reality is an independent Scotland would actually have to rely on all the oil revenues they bring in at the moment to handle the deficit we have right now. So if we had any serious volatility, we are protected by the British government and we have been... We have been... We have been protected by... You might not like it. You might not actually like it, but that's the truth. Um, and, you know, oil has been good, but let's not forget that the oil revenues are supporting the Scottish schools, our pensions, um, the NHS and all these issues. But oil cannot pay for everything. You know, we, we're listening to this debate where they, they seem to have this magic pond that say oil will pay for that. And Jackie's absolutely right. We have a 4.4 billion um, deficit and a drop in the predicted figures, their predicted figures, they were wrong. So if they're wrong now, and we're talking on supposition and theory, are we, are we going to put ourselves in that risky position to take that chance and gamble away everything for figures that, you know, the Institute of Fiscal Studies have proven and said they're wrong? OK. We'll come, come down to the front here. And, uh, yes, the man with the scarf. There are 1.3 trillion barrels of oil in the oil fields reserves worldwide. Saudi Arabia heads the league, tops the league with 261 billion barrels. Bottom of the league, North Sea, 4.9 billion barrels, due to run out in about 40 years' time. There are people in this studio who will live in a time in Scotland where we have no oil revenue. We can't balance the books. Jackie just mentioned a £12 billion deficit with oil. Scotland, the SNP came to power on the one-horse pony 
oil and it will soon be gone. We're running on fumes. Get real. OK. John Swinney, John Swinney, we're running on fumes. Uh, well, the truth is that oil has been fueling the United Kingdom public finances for the last 40 years. That's what's been happening. And if we, if we bear in mind, and the, you know, there's been a, you know, the, the numbers that have been talked about tonight are absolutely correct. There's been a 41 per cent decline in oil revenues between the last two financial years. And despite that fall, the public finances of Scotland, the public finance balances are virtually comparable to the balances of the rest of the United Kingdom. And if you go back over the last five years, Scotland has been in a stronger position to the tune of eight billion pounds. Now, at what stage does this country decide that we want to make the wealth of our country work for the economic prosperity and opportunity of our people in the future? And for me, that time is now. We've got a, an opportunity in September to ensure that we can use the resources of Scotland to the maximum advantage in creating greater economic opportunity and certainty for our people, and we should take it. But, but isn't the point, isn't the point here that, that, that the gentleman's making that even with oil, Scotland's finances are not in a good state? I mean, the Scottish deficit is 8.3% of GDP, as opposed to 7.3% for the UK average. Neither of these figures well, is a good place well, to be, is it, even well, with oil? Well, let me, let, you know, on, on the current budget balance, the Scottish public finances are in virtually the same position as the rest of the United Kingdom. And yes, on the, on the net fiscal balance, it is slightly worse in Scotland. Why? Because we took a decision as a government to invest significantly in capital expenditure in the midst of the recession to get jobs into Scotland, to get people back into work, and I'm going to make no apology for investing in the future of the Scottish economy as a consequence of the decisions we've taken. OK, yes, the man in the suit jacket in the middle of the purple shirt. Yes, I'd uh, just like to pick up a point that Jackie Bailey made when she said that Scotland would have to borrow, well, it would cost more for Scotland to borrow money without the oil and gas. Standard & Poor's said that even without oil and gas revenue, an independent Scotland would be assessed for the highest credit rating. Something Better Together had on our leaflet saying that we would only have within the UK and refuse to stop distributing even when they lost that credit rating. Yes, and um, the man in the blue shirt in the front. Hey, why is there such vast focus on the oil that Scotland has when within five years we're going to be a third of Europe's renewable energy? Thank you very much. And on that forward-looking point, we will move on to our next question. And our next question comes from Grant Blair. Grant Blair. The words, uh, the words on the Scottish mace, uh, which are wisdom, justice, compassion and integrity. Do, do we think the, uh, the politicians have demonstrated these qualities in the lead-up to the referendum? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start by asking one of them. John Swinney. Well, hang on, Let, let's just go over those values again. Wisdom, Wisdom compassion, justice and integrity. I'm sure you know them very well. I know that do, I, I, do, I, do you I, live by them, though? Well, I, 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 would, I, I aspire to, and it's up to um, members of the public, frankly, to judge whether I do or not. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, so presumptuous as to judge that, but I, those words are very, very important to me. They're part of my solemn commitment as a Member of Parliament, uh, a privilege of which is very, very dear to me that I... Uh, I'm a Member of Parliament and I uh, work to uh, live up to those aspirations at all times. But perhaps Has the more interesting well, way of well, this is, well, do well, your well, opponents live up to them? It will, it, well, I, I, there are many of my opponents do live up to them, of course they many, do. Many, but not of all. Course, well, well, you know, what I would say is that, uh, of course there are many, many of my opponents live up to those words. I think what I was coming on to say to the gentleman is that has the debate lived up to those words? And I'd have to say, no, it's not, in my estimation. I don't think the debate to date has been a credit to Scotland. And we've got six months from tonight to make the debate one that lives up to those what? values of wisdom, compassion, <laughs> justice and integrity. And if we do, and if, and if we do, and if everybody goes into the next six months in that spirit, then I think we can have a good process that determines the future of our country. Grant Blair, do you, do you have concerns in this area? 
Well, apparently there was, uh, had the mace had five sides. The one that they didn't put on was courage. <coughs> and I would love to think that that's what we're going to need lots of uh, to take this whole thing forward. OK, thank you. And Tessa Hartman, John Swinney suggests the debate has not lived up to these values so far. Do you think that's the case? I don't think it has. Um, and I think that's simply because when you talk about all these um, personal traits, um, truth should be in there and I think you know everybody in the audience has been talking tonight about why can't we have simple answers and I think sometimes we're taken as fools because again as I said before they're asking you to take this leap of dark into the dark you don't have the answers and with that comes integrity and respect and wisdom and you know I think for me to see politicians squabble and fight all, all the time is part of the game but then every time things don't go the way you know they want them to and they throw their toys out the pram and they say this is scare mama green and and you know oh, it's just it's just not appropriate okay. behavior for some statesmen thank you we'll, we'll have take a couple of points um, the woman on the edge there yes great question and great answers we really need scotland needs to get all this compassion to prevent it going to poison and get a really positive way forward Many of our challenges are being faced, you know, with young people, all sorts of things are being faced throughout the world. The spotlight is on us. So let Scotland stand up, be passionate, not poisonous, but positive. Thank you. <laughs> For the politicians that we give faith to know what the word integrity actually means. When Alex Salmond... Um, tells people that he's taking illegal advice on something that he clearly hasn't, or does Donald Trump, <laughs> or, or, or Donald Trump have a gospel for the rest of the government don't want that. Is, is that integrity? OK, thank you. We, we, we're running out of time, and we must come to this side of the table. Jackie Bailey, um, do you think that you're, you and your opponents are, are living up to these values? Um, I, I think the debate has been partially poisoned so far. I think there's been a lot of heat generated not a lot of light um, and I look well, at what like happened, to take responsibility I, for this because everybody seems think, to be saying the same well, thing I, you're I all think, involved think, in this debate I think we're all responsible okay I think we all have a responsibility for this a responsibility to be honest um, to to debate fairly but I look at companies who stand up and complain and their websites are completely taken down by the most vitriolic you know, complaints coming from, from a variety of different people that disagree with them. We need to be able to talk to each other. We need to be able, whatever the result, on the 19th of September, to move forward with each other. Um, and I am really okay. concerned that the debate has become so vitriolic, so intense, um, okay. that we're actually not going to be able okay. to do that. Very briefly, in a, in a word, Michael Fry. Well, I agree that the, uh, the debate has uh, lacked something so far. But I think, uh, so far, people have just been reacting to what's been, been said in the debate, not here, just here, but in the debate uh, in the country in general. Whereas, you know, the time is coming when we have to decide, uh, when we have to decide a very serious question. And actually, we're tremendously privileged to decide this country. Very few... Okay. Very... Very few nations get the privilege of deciding what their future is going to well, be. That is and we're going to have that it. That is an excellent consensual note to end on. I'm sure we can all agree on that. Thank you very much indeed. Our hour is up. If you want to join our audience, we'll be travelling around Scotland next month in Kirkwall on the 15th of April and then after a short break in Portree on the 8th of July. Go online and search for BBC Referendum Debate if you want to take part. Thank you very much indeed to everyone on our panel and indeed to our audience as well. And from Kirkcaldy, good night. With 16 and 17-year-olds being allowed to vote in the Scottish independence referendum, the debate continues with Generation 2014 this Saturday at 5.40 on BBC Two Scotland.